All right, guys, we'll make a start, hey? So, uh, <clears throat> obviously, everyone has your drawing from the tutorial yesterday. I'll get you to hand those to the little uh, orange thing there at the end of this lecture, so just put it in a neat pile. Um, today, I'm going to briefly talk about the project again. I know I talked about it at the tutorial, um, but there's a couple of extra little things that I want to just highlight. Um, and then we'll get into the last aspects of drawing. Uh, then the tutorial, not next week, because next week's lecture recess, but the week following will be your tutorial session on orthographics, so your front view, top view, side view stuff. Okay, so we'll have a tutorial on that as well. Um, if you can practice as many orthographic and isometric drawings over the lecture recess as you can, then you'll be in pretty good shape. Um, as I said, those, you really need to just practice them to get quick at them. <coughs> Um, the more you practice it, the more you understand the, the steps that you go through, the quicker you'll be able to put them out in an exam or a quiz or whatever. Alright, so uh, design project two, as I was saying, you have to design a centrifugal pump. Um, some of you might have looked up some research um, last night already. Uh, I highly advise you guys hit the ground running. Um, on LearnJCU, the very first thing in the project two folder is the the document that says what new group you're in. So if you weren't at the tutorial yesterday, uh, or if some of your group members were missing from the tutorial yesterday, that tells you what your group members are. And you can email each other just based on JC number. JC number's in that. Normally it's first name dot last name at my, you know, dot jcu dot edu. But sometimes that doesn't work if there's a one or something. But if you do, so JC, my number is 150. Two six at, and then for you guys, because you're students, my.jcu.edu.au. All right, so the JC number followed by at, and that's the email for anyone. All right, um, so you've got the JC numbers of all your other group members. If you didn't talk to them yesterday, please email them via that. Uh, let me know if that doesn't work. Brent and I confirmed that that worked yesterday, and that's the way it should work. So uh, you should be able to get onto each other that way. All right, but I suggest you make a group meeting for as soon as is humanly possible because if you spend two weeks thinking about other things, you'll be really behind. Um, in the outline, uh, Tuesday the 17th of May, which is week 12, that's when your principal pump files need to be submitted. So that will be once you have a finished pump done up in SolidWorks, a full assembly, then what you do is you convert them to STL files and that's just a simple save as and just change the file type. Uh, that's all in the outline or all in the design guidelines. Uh, and then you put that and a few other things on a CD and you bring that to your tutorial and we send it to the printer there and then, okay? So uh, you need to make sure that everything's in line. One of the workshop classes, so by one I mean one week of workshops, so that's all of the Monday rooms, all of the Tuesday rooms is purely devoted to you guys coming and checking your pump designs and asking the tutors any questions. Okay, so there is no assigned class for that week. I think that's, what is it, the beginning of week, possibly 12, it's in the outline anyway. Um, those classes are for you to come and check any final things with pumps, ask any questions. Anyone can rock up to those classes, you don't need to be assigned to that week, okay? So that's what, uh, in the outline, we have a pump consultation workshop, that's what that is. So please use that wisely. We'll also have a consultation tutorial on the pumps where Brent and I will be in the room and you guys can ask us questions about your design and your report and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then the report's obviously due Monday of that SWAT back. So week 13, that weekend, and then the Monday immediately following. Okay? You don't want to be doing too much work on it over that weekend or that Monday because that's the end of semester and you guys want to be out partying and having a good time before you have to start studying. So make sure you're done well before that and you can just use that time for editing. And then we'll test in the Friday of lecture recess, as I said. Uh, sorry, test in the fr last Friday of the exam period. Um, once we have the final exam schedule, I'll make sure that there's nothing clashing with that, but that should be a long way away from anything you're worried about. All right, so you will have all seen the marking rubrics. Uh, so your marks for the build are aligned with how good your pump is. Okay, so what pressure your pump will push. Uh, effectively, if you rock up and give me a CD and it's got garbage on it or stuff I can't print, um, you get 0.75% out of that 7.5. 
If you rock up and you give me a bunch of printable stuff and I print your pump out, hand it to you and then you don't build it and don't rock up on the last day, you get 1.5%. If you rock up and give me something I can print, I give it to you, you put it together and come back and give it to me and then walk away, you pass. All right, without even testing the pump, so long as you actually take your 3D printed bits, assemble them, glue whatever needs to be glued, come back and say, hey, I've got a pump, you pass. All right? And then after that, 4%, so as a pass, your pump operates. So it actually pushes water, even if it's really, really bad and you know, doesn't push very much water, you get 4. 5.25 is shut off head above 2 metres, so I can push water above about that. Six is a distinction you push above four metres, so that pump I showed you in the tutorial of mine was about 4.75, so you're getting up towards, you know, pretty good centrifugal pump design. If you can push above five metres, you get seven and a half percent, and three or four groups did that last year, okay? Um, and then for the absolute best pressure, you get a bonus one percent, so you get eight and a half percent for a seven and a half percent task which means effectively uh, if you lose a percent somewhere else that boosts you up or if you've got 100% of everything you get 101% you're great. Cool? Alright, so uh, there's a report marking criteria sheet as well. Once again all your marks are going to be just lined up with that. Make sure you've got all of the things. Um, and where the first project I was holding your hand and telling you which bit to do when and which week to do your PDS and which week to do your research brief and that sort of stuff, that is not the case for this project. This project is now completely up to you to manage that process. All right? So hopefully by my giving you Gantt charts and we walking you through the process on project one and you understanding roughly when things happen and now you are understand roughly how long it takes to write bits and pieces of that final report. The final report will be structured within a template identical to the one you used in first semester, but that's up to you. So you're welcome to, uh, sorry, in, in the first project. You're welcome to take that template and strip all of the bits out of it and then put your new bits into it. Uh, again, I'm not giving you templates for the sections. I'm not giving you templates for the whole document. That's up to you to make sure that everything required is in that. Okay, so take what you learnt in the first project, apply it all to the second project, but from here until when it's due, with the exception of that tutorial class and the workshop class and any conversations we have outside of that, uh, that is your major class time devoted to this project. Okay, so this is now a, an authentic university project where you manage it and make sure that you submit it on time. Is that clear to everyone? Cool? So don't wait till week three to work out that I'm not telling you what to do in a lecture. Make sure you do it. Cool. Alright, ah, and last thing. Let's see if SolarWorks will actually open on this machine. Now, uh, I've said in the outline that you need to do a SolarWorks sustainability analysis. You guys won't know what that is. Uh, you guys know how to do a sustainability analysis like what we did in class. SolarWorks actually has some pretty neat tools to help you do that, okay? So you'll do the standard thing that we did in the lecture and the tutorial, but SolidWorks, you can put your part into SolidWorks and say what it's made out of and where it's going to be made, and it will tell you what emissions are going to be involved and what sorts of chemicals will be released in the environment and how much energy and that kind of stuff to actually make that part. Okay, so it's a very useful tool. Uh, in the past I've had it as an actual workshop, so one of your five workshops. It's really quick and people normally knock it off in about half an hour and it didn't seem worthwhile to have it as a workshop this year. I'm just going to point you to where the tutorial actually is and you guys can do that in your own time, okay? Um, because what we're going to do is portfolios instead and that's a little bit more important to your, you know, your long-term university career. All right, so if I, in SolarWorks, everyone can see my SolarWorks window up here. If I want to actually find the sustainability thing, I go to Home and the Tutorials. Everyone knows where those tutorials are, don't they? Yep. So this is some independent learning stuff. You can do as many of these as you want. If you still think, feel un, or ill-equipped to do a certain thing on your centrifugal pump, you can go here and find a tutorial that will help you. You can also find hundreds of thousands of YouTube videos. 
There are people pumping out SolarWorks YouTube videos all over the world of how to do a loft and how to do this and how to do that. So if you can't do something in SolarWorks, don't just give up or wait until a class to ask the tutors or I. Find a YouTube video, find a tutorial here. And all of the tutorials, these are sort of categorised, but if I go to, where's my all tutorials? Advanced Techniques Space. All SolarWorks tutorials there. These are all of the SolarWorks tutorials that are available to you to do. There's some simulation ones, there's parts, assemblies, all sorts of things. And down here, you see the sustainability uh, there. That one will give you a how-to guide how to use the sustainability tool in SolarWorks. And that's what you can use to actually evaluate how many emissions and so forth your part will create. All right, so go through that tutorial and you'll be equipped to do what you need in terms of analysis for the project. Any questions on that? No? Great. Well, let's get rid of that. All right, so the rest of the today, um, we're just going to do the final part of drawing. And so we've talked a little bit about dimensions um, and now we're going to talk a, bit, a little bit more about dimensions and some sections and then we'll be done, okay? Um, so, why do we dimension a drawing? So you know the sizes? Who needs to know sizes? The guy that's making the piece, potentially. Who else? Sorry? Yeah, well, you need to know whether it's going to fit. Yeah, so whoever's commissioned you to actually make this thing? Anyone that's going to look at the drawing, yeah. Other engineers? Who else are you working with? Who's making it? Who's asked for it? You know, so lots of different people are going to be viewing this document. And so dimensions, is a drawing any use to anyone if you don't know how big it is? Not really. I mean, you, you can see the shape, but from a technical standpoint, that drawing is effectively useless if you don't know how big it is. Um, now, you can send in the SolarWorks files, but, you know, that's, that's assuming they have SolarWorks. And SolarWorks, one thing I didn't mention in the beginning of the semester, you guys all have SolarWorks on your computers if you have installed it. That is for educational use. You guys ticked, uh, yeah, I'm only going to use this for educational use box when you installed it that's your commitment that you're not going to go off and start trying to use it as a consultant because if you do, both you and I get sued. Um, because SolarWorks, if you want to actually get paid to use it, the version of the software is 20 to 30 grand. Okay? So, SolarWorks is a great tool, but the reason consulting engineers get like $500 an hour to work on it is because they have to cover all of their overheads, including, you know, 20 grand for SolarWorks and 30 grand for ANSYS and, you know, all of these extra expenses that they need to pay. Okay, so when you hand a SolarWorks drawing to someone, maybe they can open it, maybe they haven't forked out the 30 grand to actually get the software. So you're much more likely to be able to communicate things through a dimension drawing than just sending them a part file and hoping for the best, okay? And fundamentally, we're talking about communication, so if you're not giving people dimensions, you're not actually communicating what you need. Um, now, when you're putting dimensions on a drawing, who's on their SolarWorks drawing just put dimensions anywhere and just gone, yeah, that's fine? Everyone put your hands up. So I haven't taught you about where to put dimensions yet, so that's completely understandable. After today, any SolarWorks drawing that you submit with dimensions on it will adhere to what I'm telling you right now. So everyone nod and agree that they're going to listen to me. Excellent. All right. So where practical, dimensions should be placed outside of the object. So you don't want your dimensions overlapping with lines and things inside of the object. So you try to get your dimensions neat and outside of the object. Otherwise, it becomes very convoluted, particularly if you have a lot of hidden detail and that sort of stuff. All right. Always inside the page border. This is the most common one that I see. All right. Here's my page. Here's my page border. Here's my very complicated machine component.
There's my dimension. That's an exaggeration, but I have seen time and time again, and always will, you know, things like this. Right? Page border, dimension outside of it. All right? In SolarWorks or anywhere else, you never put a single thing outside that page border in a technical drawing. Okay, so everyone who does a dimension on any sort of SolarWorks drawing from now on, you can drag them around. You just click on them and drag them around until it looks neat. It's communication. Part of that communication is being clear and neat. All right? One thing, you see both of my dimensions here, at least they're not on the inside, so at least I've not done this or this. You see, because if that's a hard line there, I don't know whether that line means that I've got three lines or two lines or what that line actually means. It's very confusing to have that dimension on the inside there. So dimensions on the outside, but within the page border. All right? So if you achieve that in your SolarWorks drawings, then I'll be happy. All right. Dimensions should always be oriented such that they can be read from the bottom or the right-hand side of the drawing. All right? What that means is... If I'm at the bottom of the drawing, I can read that because that's basically the way I'm looking, all right? As if I'm holding the page that way, that's the way it would write. Alternatively, if I was sitting here and holding the page that way, I can write a dimension like this, 40, such that I can read it from the right. Both of those things are correct. That's a standard thing for a drawing. Or, you know, alternatively, you can have this like that. This is incorrect because I'm reading that from this side and that's not the bottom, it's not the right, okay? So also, if you want to be pedantic about it, how do I do that? That's incorrect too, is that a 50? Yeah. All right, so you don't do them upside down, you don't do them from the left, you only do them from the bottom or the right. All right, that's the standard for dimensions. And your drawing should only show the minimum number of dimensions required to fully resolve it, okay? And I'll talk a little bit more about that. I've already talked about that. You've had a go at it in your drawings, so hopefully you're across that. All right. So, there are three types of dimensions. You have size dimensions, so how big is something, so that box, how big was it? You have location and orientation dimensions, so you've got a hole, it's got a size is the first type, where is the hole is the second type, and then you've got mating dimensions or tolerances, all right, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about tolerances in a second, but here we've got a drawing. Which dimensions would you say would be size dimensions? Anyone? What's a size dimension? Just call out a number. Eight. Eight? Eight is definitely a size dimension. That is the length of this plate. What else? Four. Yeah, four's the width. What else? One. Yeah, so one's the size of that hole. And 2.5 is the size of that hole. So we've got four size dimensions. What about location dimensions? Two two and six. They're all positioning these in space. What about tolerances? Yeah, so two of those. For the two holes, you've got plus 0.1 and minus 0.3 and plus 0.2 and minus 0.1. Those are the tolerances. All right. What that means is when a machinist looks at that, they can drill that hole and they know that that hole can either be 1.1 or it can be 0.1. Minus 0.3 is pretty significant, actually. 0.7. <coughs> so that's actually a very wide range that that hole can be. Um, but if that was much, much less, then the, the machinist would have to drill that and then get out their vernier calipers or their hole sizing kit, make sure it's right. If it's not right, take a little bit more off and continue on that way. And if they go too far, they have to start the whole process again. All right, so that's why it starts costing a lot of money when you have detailed tolerances. Here's another example. So you can see some dimensions have tolerances, some dimensions don't have tolerances. When I just have 
say, a length. If this is just screwing into something, then having a plus or minus 0 0.01 tolerance on that length there, perhaps, that might be meaningless. If you have a housing and you have a thickness of the housing, if it's not actually marrying up with anything, the thickness of the housing doesn't need a tolerance on it. It doesn't matter if it's plus or minus a bit. If you have some sort of a, a hole or a shaft or things mating with each other, that's when you need those tolerances. If you need to fit a bearing in something, then that you need a tolerance. Um, and you can have a wide range of tolerances that I'll talk about. All right. Um, I alluded to this a little bit the other day, but there's a few different forms of dimensioning. One is direct dimensioning, okay? So direct dimensioning is where you actually just stick a dimension on it. You say, this is 64 long. That's a dimension. Obviously, we know full well that that's 64 long. 45, etc. cetera, all right? So a direct dimension is anything you've actually dimensioned. Indirect dimensions is basically features that you can deduce from existing dimensions. So you've got enough dimensions there to get out a calculator and work out the difference. So, for example, total length of this item. Is there a dimension on this that gives you end-to-end -end length of that component? No. Can we work it out, though? Yep. So what is it? It is 114 plus 32 plus 32. Yeah? Easy enough. You've got this length, 64, and you've got this thickness, 13. What's the thickness of this section here? Thirteen. Yep. So you can calculate it from the fact that 64 minus 38 minus 13 equals 13. Or you can actually infer it as an implicit dimension also because it's pretty clear to anyone that that looks like the same thickness all the way around. An implicit dimension is something that's inferred from the drawing based on common sense. All right. What's the diameter of the circular feature on the right here, or what's the radius of that circular feature? 32. Is that dimension on the drawing? No? Do we need it on the drawing to understand that that's 32? The only time you'd need a dimension on that is if it wasn't 32. If it was slightly different for some reason, then you'd need that dimension. But the hole on the right, the circular feature on the right, doesn't have a dimension on it because it's clear to us that that's 32 because the exact same thing is on the other side. That's an implicit dimension. You don't need to dimension every single hole if they're all the same and it makes sense to look at it, see one dimension and go, all right, well, there's a pattern of six of them. They're not going to be different. So you can save on dimension cl and clarity by implicit dimensions, by indirect dimensions, and anything else needs a direct dimension. All right, is that clear? So that's how we make sure that we don't have hundreds of different arrows. You just don't chuck dimensions on wherever you think. You go through a systematic process like I talked about the other day, and you make use of those three types of dimensioning wherever possible. All right, so specific tolerances. There's a few different ways that you can write tolerances on a drawing. Limit dimension on the top left. Basically, you say it can be between this and this. So that uh, shaft could be uh, 1.5005, or it could be 1.5, or it could be anything in between. All right? And that is a very, very accurate shaft. That type of tolerance, that many zeros, that will take someone a hell of a long time and very, very accurate equipment to actually achieve. All right? So that, if you have that many zeros, you better really, really need that many zeros in your tolerance. It better be a very important rocket that you're building. All right, so um, on the right there, bilateral equal. So what that means is bilateral, it goes up and down. Bi. So, uh, and when it's bilateral equal, you can just indicate that by a plus or minus 0 0.0002. All right, and so that means it can be 1.500, how many zeros, 2, or 1.4998, or whatever it is, yeah? So bilateral equal means it's plus or minus the same value. Unilateral, down the bottom left, means it only goes one way. So it's either exact or it's a little bit bigger, or it's exact or it's a little bit smaller. 
Okay, so minus zero and plus 0 0.005, so that's unilateral and it can be a little bit bigger or exact. And then the bottom right, bilateral unequal means it can be a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller, but the amount bigger it can be is not the same as the amount smaller it can be. Okay? So those are all the different types of tolerances that you might require. Now the reason that we have tolerances is generally for fits. All right? There are different types of fits that components will need to each other. Okay? So if you want a loose running fit, that means that if you've got a shaft or something that's running inside a bush, it can run fairly easily. That's a loose running fit and you specify the hole based on a H11, C11 type tolerance and that then has an associated plus or minus factor. If you went to a tolerance textbook, you'd just look at C11 for a 15 millimeter shaft, it would give you plus or minus whatever that needs to be. And that would ensure that when you put that tolerance on the hole and put that tolerance on the shaft, that they can have a plus or minus, but they've always got at least the gap between them that they need to give you a loose running fit. And then we move down this, so this is loose, free running, close running, all the way down to a force fit. And a force fit is effectively the shaft is much bigger than the hole. All right? And so shaft bigger than a hole, you can't get it in there. And what you actually have to do is get the shaft and you put that in liquid nitrogen potentially. You get um, an oxy and you heat up the entire hole. So one shrinks, one expands and you put them together. And then as they cool, the shaft expands again and the other thing contracts. And so now there's an interference. We've got a shaft like this and the hole like that. That's what they would look like originally. And as they shrink, you put them together, they'd expand and they'd deform to a point where effectively now the shaft has a pinch in it and the hole has a stretch in it and that's actually going to hold. All right? So that that approach is sufficient if this was a gear or something. You could actually attach a gear to a shaft without a keyway or a spline or anything if you have a decent interference fit. Because of the friction that results between those planes, because that keeps wanting to, uh, the, the shaft keeps wanting to get, sorry, the hole keeps wanting to get smaller and the shaft keeps wanting to get bigger. And so it, it has force on that surface. And so the friction between those surfaces is enough to hold things like gears and big pulleys and that kind of stuff, all right? So all sorts of different applications anywhere between bearings. You generally need some sort of fit in the middle here because you don't want your bearing falling out. And particularly if that bearing actually has to take thrust loads, then you need to have, you know, the bearing will be a little bit bigger than the hole. And so all of those tolerances for a specific application, you need to work out what the machine component does and then choose an appropriate tolerance. So you guys won't need to do that until you get about maybe second, third year mechanical if you're doing that. Um, other disciplines probably need to know about tolerances less. Maybe chems do it a little bit in process stuff. But I wanted to talk about this because we talk about the dimensioning and what the actual tolerance is, is in a dimension, but it's very easy to brush over that and not understand the context for that. The context is we actually use overlapping components for very specific applications. All right, so that's why we set tolerances up. All right, so um, I showed you this 2D line type. That's pretty much all I have for dimensions. I'm going to talk quickly about sections and why we use them, and then we'll be done. Okay, so you guys, anyone that's finished the workshop will have seen the last screencast is doing a section of the, uh, that hub shaft upright arrangement. Um, in the drawing examples for the project, I've asked for one of those drawings to have a section of the actual centrifugal pump like the example I gave you guys. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why we do sections. This is one set of the line types. This is a bit of an expanded just from a different textbook. Um, the reason that I'm putting this here is because of this and this. You can actually include kind of a squiggly line if you only want to section part of an item. So you can do a whole section if it makes sense to do that, but if you only want to just cut a hole and just show a little bit of section, you can do that and indicate it with that squiggly line. You see, I've got section on the left of it, 
and no section on the right of it there. All right, so that basically means I've just chopped out a little bit there. Um, same thing, if you've got an item that continues on at nauseam, so that might be a, you know, a, a very large section, you can use this line with a bit of a zigzag in it to indicate that that material continues on forever or you know, theoretically for a long way. All right, so when I'm talking about sectioning, I've got some examples here. This is one example where you might use one of those partial sections. And so the main reason to do that is to understand the actual screw hole here. So we want to see that screw hole and that would be very confusing if that was just hidden detail. Here's a really good technical drawing of what is probably some sort of a, a pulley or a, maybe a hub shaft type thing. And you see you've got the front view here and a section A, section B. This section moves over to the right there and so you can see all of the detail inside there and get dimensions on that kind of stuff. Then it's got blown up detail, C over here and D over there and that sort of stuff. So this is a good technical drawing. Look how many dimensions are on it. Look at all the different notes. I know you can't read them, but see how each of those holes has a little note on what sort of screw is going to go in it, what sort of thread it needs to be cut at and so forth. You see a really nice border and title block. You see the dimensions don't go outside of the border. The dimensions, for the most part, aren't inside the actual item. They're all nice and neat and evenly spaced. That's a good technical drawing, all right? And you're using sections there to understand basically the inside components. Here's a 2D section. So <coughs> this is a gear, and that's a pulley, and that's just its mount, so a couple of bearings. And obviously, if I'm manufacturing that or trying to understand what the components are, if I don't have a section there, I have no idea what this internal step geometry is like. And steps are really important for bearings because obviously you can't just throw a bearing in a hole. You need some sort of a step to retain it so it can't move because if it moves, your shaft is going to fall off and there goes the wheels on your car or whatever. All right, so sections give you very detailed view on the inside there. Um, this is a pillow block bearing. And you can see if I just showed you the outside of that, you wouldn't have any idea what's going on. So this is an example of a 3D section. What's actually going on here is we have a retaining um, uh, race for the actual bearings there. Um, and then the bearings going around there. This is another example of a 3D section. So you can see you have the 3D view and then a 3D section that shows you a lot of different information. So sections allow you to sort of look inside. And it's a very good drawing technique that you should use. It's difficult to do when you're doing it by hand. It's very easy to use the tools in SolarWorks that are in that workshop. All right. And this is an example of my centrifugal pump that I made. And you can see, uh, it's a little bit hard to see in that light. All right, you can see in 2D, it allows me to indicate where my bearings are going, where my radial shaft seal is going, where this shaft goes and where the actual impeller lives. And I can label all of my different parts in a bill of materials. And this table is called a bill of materials. Basically, it's all of the different parts. And then in 3D, I can choose some things to be sectioned and some things not. So it's not, I don't want my seal section, I don't want my bearings or shaft section, but I do want the housings and the impeller section. And you can see my little fins at the front there that are sort of sucking the water in and then converting that flow to the impeller. So it's starting to give you a little bit more detail about what's going on and you can start to understand how the machine component actually works. Cool? So that's the sort of drawing that I want you to produce. I've got lots of examples on LearnJCU about that. All right, so that's pretty much everything I've got for you on drawing. That's the last couple of things that we needed to talk about. Um, as I said, tutorial, not next week, but the week after, because next week's lecture recess will be on orthographic drawing, and we'll be putting some of these dimensioning and things into practice there. Um, everyone should have your tutorial drawing. Please hand that to a neat pile over here, and otherwise, have a good Wednesday.